welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tyler Reed, and I'm the Manufacturing Application Manager here at Go Engineer. Today we have 3D printing past, present, and future. Reading that now, I sure bit off a lot. That's a lot to talk about in 40, 45 minutes, but we're going to do our best. My background is in mechanical engineering, and I'm guessing a lot of the people here listening today are involved in the engineering field, but 3D printing is a technology that has moved into the mainstream over the past five, six, seven years to the point where everybody I know, everybody I talk to, whether or not they're in high school or they're my grandparents, they're aware of 3D printing, which is something that's very different than even five years ago. Uh, so it's very, li very likely that we have people in the fashion industry listening right now, in food processing, totally outside the engineering background, which is really neat. That's a change that we're seeing and is going to continue to propagate over the next few years. Over the past, say, 10 years, 3D printing has transitioned from what we would call a rapid prototyping technology to something a little bit more broad called additive manufacturing. We're going to go over the history a little bit, but 3D printing started and was marketed and was even called rapid prototyping up until the early 2000s, so for almost 20 years. And that's really what it was used for. Over the past 10 years, as materials have improved, machines have improved, but mainly as more and more people from all sorts of different industries and sectors have become acquainted with 3D printing, it's become more of this broad, generalized additive manufacturing technology. Trends are showing us that the adoption of 3D printing and the growth of the markets, both the commercial and the consumer markets, are trending upward significantly. We'll look at a few numbers here later on towards the end of the presentation, but it's important to know now that 3D printing is here. It's going to be used more for production parts and more for tooling and anything non-prototyping. And we're gonna talk about where it is now and what are the main applications now and how we get into more production tooling later on. So the past, historically, we're looking at two graphs here overlaid one on top of the other. We're looking at industrial machine sales of 3D printing from about 85 to 2012, which is where this data was most current. And also superimposed on that in the columns are people reporting their first experience with 3D printing. So what we see here is that a small number of 3D printing users have been around for a long time. You know, as early back as 85, and some people reporting their first experience being in the 90s. Uh, but then right around 2005, we start to see a huge uptake in people experiencing 3D printing for the first time. Thinking back, I fall somewhere in that 2007, 2008 range myself. Uh, and I experienced 3D printing for the first time in my senior design class at, uh, at university. We can also see an uptick in industrial machine sales. So my guess here is that the data for, th for the first 3DP experience is actually more from the consumer side. But we see even an increase in machine sales on the industrial side kind of coinciding there with pretty solid growth from 2003 onward minus a, a small tick there with a recession in 2008 going into 2009. And so this kind of brings up this point where the consumer side and the proliferation of 3D printers at home or small scale, low cost 3D printers in the office or in maker spaces or hacker spaces has kind of fueled the industrial market, which is as far as revenue goes, much larger than the consumer side now and for the foreseeable future. So here's a timeline here going from 85 to 2015, current time. Uh, I started with 85 because that's when the first 3D printing patent was granted. And that was to Chuck Hole who invented SLA or stereolithography. The development of those 3D printing processes actually started earlier in the late 70s. And the first patent was filed in actually 1980, but it was never granted. The first commercial sale was in 87 and SLS was patented in 89 by Carl Deckard and his team at University of Texas. SLA and SLS were the original 3D printing technologies and they're still around today. SLA being developed by 3D Systems and SLS being developed by a company which at the time was called Desktop Manufacturing which was later absorbed by 3D Systems in the mid-2000s. 
Come 92, the FDM process was patented by uh, Scott Crump and the, starting with the company Stratasys. Starting in the mid-early 90s, really, we have 3D Systems and Stratasys, and those are the two mainstay plastic 3D printing companies still around today. One of the other companies that was around at that time is EOS, and they were looking into the SLS technology, and they are still around today, and they are mostly doing DMLS, which is direct metal laser sintering. We see a few more technologies being developed and patented through the 90s. We got SLM and LOM, which SLM is a metal technology, and LOM is uh, more of like a paper or a vinyl or plastic technology. And a few other companies coming onto the board too, with Solidscape, Z Corp, RCAM, Object. Most of those outside of RCAM have all been absorbed into 3D systems and Stratasys. 3D printing has a long history of acquisitions and mergers within the industry. It's not really until you know the past 10 years that we saw a proliferation of new companies in the space with, with Shapeways with their online service bureau, a couple other metal and sand or gypsum technologies. And then starting in 2004, uh, a project called RepRap. And we saw in the last slide where there was a huge uptick in people being exposed to 3D printing right around the 2005 era. And that's tied into this RepRap project, which was an open source, do-it-yourself consumer 3D printer. And from there, the company MakerBot was formed, which was later purchased by Stratasys. And the rest is kind of history. The past five years, we've seen literally hundreds of new companies pop up and hundreds into the thousands of new patents being filed for new 3D printing technologies and new novel ways of creating geometry in a 3D environment. So the result here is that we have ended up in a place where we have 3D printing as a generalized technology and, but within that technology, we have different ways of creating 3D parts using different materials and different mechanisms. What you see here are just a sample of some of the most popular technologies or ways to create 3D printed parts. We see some that we mentioned, SLA and SLS being the original plastic technologies using photopolymers that are UV cured in the case of SLA or powderized polymers that are cured using UV laser in SLS. We also have FDM and Polyjet, which are the two technologies that Stratasys now incorporates in their portfolio. FDM being invented by Stratasys and then Polyjet acquired through the merger between Object and Stratasys back in 2011. DMLS, EBM, and SLM are probably three technologies to really acquaint yourself with if you're interested in the future direction of 3D printing because those are all metal printing technologies that we see more and more of every day as new uses and new case studies come out that justify the use of metal 3D printing technologies. The two I'm most familiar with are FDM and Polyjet, and the reason for that is the company I'm, I work with, Go Engineer. We are globally the number one reseller for Stratasys, and these are the two technologies that I deal with every day. So we're going to see probably a little bit skewed examples from these technologies, but I have examples from all different technologies coming up in the presentation. Nice thing about these two technologies is that they're very complementary. We have thermoplastics and we have photopolymers. They're all in the plastic arena, but within the plastic realm, you can get all sorts of different combinations of capabilities or strengths or any sort of mechanical or qualitative property you could think of. So materials is obviously important because without having the right material, 3D printing doesn't really make sense for a lot of end use applications. So once we move away from the rapid prototyping phase, normally materials become more important because the material that we print in has to either simulate accurately what we're trying to prototype or withstand the forces or pressures or temperatures that we need for an end use part. So I've kind of broken it down into metals, plastics, and other, and just listed some of the most common materials that we're printing in today. And I've highlighted some of the ones that I think are most important or most commonly used. On the plastic side, ABS has been the, the go-to material for on the FDM technology for a long time since its inception. And PLA has been the go-to material on the consumer side. Nice thing that PLA has going for it is that it's a biomaterial. It's not quite as harsh on the environment years into the future as ABS is. Uh, but we can print in some engineering grade plastics like nylon, polycarbonate, 
And in cases of nylons, we can have filled composites, either with, say, carbon fiber or glass-filled composites. And then the last one I touched on in the plastics is the Ultem. Ultem material is a very high heat, high temperature, FAA certifiable plastic. So I'm going to cover an example later on where we see printed Ultem or printed plastic parts in flight today. Going into the metals, the two key metals going forward, I believe, are going to be titanium and cobalt chrome. Those are the two metals that are being used most popularly today. Titanium for end use automotive and aerospace applications and cobalt chrome mainly for medical applications. The nice thing about titanium is that it has very high strength to weight and stiffness to weight ratio. But typically titanium was relegated only for uh, the most demanding or most expensive projects. Uh, because it's hard to work with, it's difficult to machine, it's difficult to weld. And so typically we'd, we would use aluminum for our go-to metal. But now with 3D printing, moving away from the machining and the casting, printing actually opens the door to titanium and makes it wide open to where titanium is now, you could say it's the aluminum of machining. It's, it's your go-to metal in many cases. The other category could have been extremely long. I had to limit myself here because there's just so many different people out there in different industries using XYZ linear axis machines or even delta shaped machines to print almost any material you can think of. Gypsum and wax have been commercially used for a long time. Ceramics are a newer one that's offered through Shapeways and other online service bureaus mainly. Paper is one that's been used with the LOM technology and most notably MCOR lately on the commercial side. Biomaterials I have highlighted because it's one that I'm not aware of being used extensively uh, in the commercial arena yet. It's mostly university funded research projects right now, but it has a huge potential for future applications in say printed tissues for testing or uh, printed tissues for repair of the human body, all sorts of different use cases. Food and concrete are th other things that people are looking into. Concrete for you know structural buildings and low cost, on demand, rapid housing, for example. So the future is gonna be in more printed materials. When we look at the industries that we're currently involved in, in the present, aerospace and defense, automotive and medical are the top three industries by far. I know we at Go Engineer also sell very heavily into industrial plants, energy plants, and any sort of business that's involved in creating parts on site. So you have assembly stations that we are outfitting with 3D printed parts and replacing aluminum and Delrin machine parts. And that's one of the top applications, be it fixtures or rollers or gears replacement parts that would typically have to come from the machine manufacturer and take months or weeks to arrive, we can print on-site on demand. But also, very, really surprising is the fashion industry is becoming a huge player in the 3D printing market. They're really driving some of the more obscure but really creative uses of 3D printing going into 3D printed fabrics and algorithmic mathematical creation of geometry to create these free flowing shapes is outstanding. Jewelry benefits from it not only for the shape creation but we can create say a wax or a photopolymer mold that is used in lost wax investment casting. So a lot of these industries are involved with 3D printing kind of as a, not a substitute for their current processes, in this case with jewelry casting, but as a technology that can help that casting process become more efficient or more quick. Something like retail is an industry that's growing and there's certainly growth potential there, but we're not seeing it a lot where companies are involving themselves in actually selling the 3D printed parts in a retail scenario, but it is happening. So some of the current applications that I, that I see on a day-to-day -day basis being as some of the most compelling cases for 3D printing, we're going to kind of cover some of these. Prototyping is number one. I've seen studies that point to prototyping still being about 60% the use of 3D printing. I agree with that. It's still the number one use of 3D printing, but with more materials at our disposal and more functional and certifiable materials, that prototyping has gone from something that's just a conceptual model to something that actually is functional in an environment that may be corrosive or high temperature or high pressure. 
And then there's a category I call digital manufacturing, which is using 3D printing alongside an existing way of creating parts. So these are our mold patterns, our jigs and fixtures using 3D printed parts to help us create carbon fiber layups and even injection molded parts. And then the last category here, I actually do see quite a bit are marketing groups getting into 3D printing to help them convey ideas to their own team and to potential customers and help them set themselves apart from their competition. So one of the first uses that people are exposed to 3D printing is they want to create a shape and they print it because it is easier to print a shape than it is to go through the machining process. This is conceptual modeling. Here's a shoe I have printed and one of the unique things about this I mean, it's, it's full size, it's an accurate model, uh, but it actually has eight or nine different materials that I chose in here. Everything from a very flexible rubber-like material to some very stiff, rigid whites and grays and everything in between. So this is something I can put in a prospective customer's hands or my boss's hands and say, this is the shape I've created. You can look at it in 3D, you can hold it, you can garner information from it that is very difficult to receive if you're just looking at a model through a render or through a computer screen. I can create that very rapidly. Even though it's a very complex shape, I can print it overnight with really no extra effort needed on the manufacturing phase because of the complex shape. And that's one of the main keys, obviously, of 3D printing. Going into a, like a fit and finish type prototype. This is a prototype of an intake manifold from a company called Integrated Engineering that is very heavily involved in the Volkswagen Audi aftermarket process. And they use SolidWorks and FEA analysis to design these intake manifolds. They're optimized for flow, uh, but it becomes very hard to actually bench test them and make sure that they fit in this very complex jumbled environment that is a car engine. So they end up going through dozens of prototypes just to make sure that the part fits in the engine bay and that it's easily installed by the end user, which in this case is one of the owners of the car. That's another key step, assembly or disassembly that's usually hard to anticipate any problems if you don't have a physical model. They can go through dozens of prototypes that are prototyping fit, function, and an assortment of other things that you might want in a span of a week as opposed to fitting in a single or maybe two prototypes into a budget and extending that prototyping process out to months. Designing parts to be ergonomically friendly is hard. There are several reasons for that. The creation of the geometry can be difficult, but also humans don't come in you know, set sizes. There's no such thing as a small, medium, large person. We work in percentages of people, but also fit is, and, and comfort is actually very subjective. So 3D printing plays into this very well because again, complex swoopy shapes are very difficult to machine. They're expensive, they're time consuming. And even with casting, you know, there's extra added expense for complexity. But with 3D printing, there's almost no downside. What you're looking at is a mouse called the Stacial Mouse and it's from Piot Design. And one of the neat things about this mouse is the built-in mechanism. So if you look at the center there, there's actually sort of this spider gear that a person can move these body panels essentially in and out and change the shape on the fly. That mechanism is printed all as one part, which is outrageous. This is a very complex shape, but it again can be created overnight and customized by a user. And Charles Pyatt, the designer of this, can actually offer this design and become not only a designer, but an entrepreneur and build a business around manufacturing parts, even though he might be outsourcing the parts through a company like Shapeways or through a website like 3D Hubs, or he might bring printing in-house, have a little bit more control over it, but now all of a sudden he's a manufacturer as well as a designer, and he's a distributor. He doesn't have to keep inventory, he just prints parts on demand when they're ordered. Totally different way of looking at your conventional supply chain. Here's a functional prototype. This is from a company called AirDog. AirDog was funded on Kickstarter, I believe, last year. And they created this quadcopter or UAV that actually follows the person who is wearing on their wrist sort of a transmitter. And it helps people who are into action sports like snowboarding or windsurfing or extreme running, maybe, get these cool aerial views 
and aerial footage that you wouldn't normally be able to get because we can't afford to pay uh, helicopter pilots to follow us, right? So they went into this Kickstarter scenario where they're asking for funding for a product. It's very difficult to convince people to give you money uh, on something that doesn't exist yet, right? So they were able to create 3D printed prototypes, create videos using these prototypes, put those videos up online, and that convinces people not only have we designed this, but we printed it, it exists in three dimensions, and it works. And for that reason, they had a hugely successful Kickstarter campaign. So this acted as a functional prototype, but also their marketing, which we're seeing more and more of, is consumers that grew up in the computer age have become more savvy, and they actually demand more proof that their product works. So that's why we are always looking at video reviews and making sure that products that we buy or the best and they work and we can take our prototyping that we have to do anyway and use it as our marketing or use our FEA analysis, our simulation analysis and use it as our marketing. Moving out of the prototype phase and more into that digital manufacturing category, I see 3D printed parts being used as mold patterns quite often. Here's an example that I did of a cast urethane part. There's a lot of incentives to use polyurethanes in the industry. They're extremely wear resistant, abrasion resistant, tear resistant. They can be flexible or extremely rigid. They're very durable parts, but you can't really print directly in urethane, but we can create castings of urethane. So in this case here, I printed the negative and I'm backfilling with urethane. But we also use urethane in another way where if we have, say, a sheet metal forming tool that needs additional strength beyond what we can provide in just a 3D printed material, we can actually backfill the parts and increase the strength uh, using a, a cast urethane. It's quite neat. So I can manufacture and prototype this shape, which is quite complex if I wanted to machine it with the text coming in sideways like that, out of a three-part mold that I can create on my own within the span of a single day, which is what I did. I cast it at home versus going through a vendor and paying several hundreds into the thousands of dollars for a single or just a handful of prototypes. Fixturing and jigs are a number two use of 3D printing. It's one of the main reasons we sell into companies like Rutland Plastics who use jigs and fixtures in their assembly line and in their inspection processes day in, day out. And the creation of those jigs and fixtures are added steps needed to ensure quality for parts that they're going to create. And these jigs and fixtures, they require almost just as much thought into the creation of these and into the manufacturing of these as the end use parts. So if we can create jigs and fixtures more easily and for cheaper, then it makes a lot of sense through 3D printing. And that's what Rutland Plastics has done. They have a fixture here that is an assembly fixture. On the bottom there, you see a injection molded part that is going to have some threaded inserts inserted into it. So we have to hold this part in anticipation of inserting these threaded inserts. We have to hold it steady and we have to convey some information to the operator or whoever on the assembly line is doing that insertion. So with 3D printing, we can create this very ergonomic shape to cradle our part. We can print in some instructions. So there's never any question in whether or not the job is being done correctly. And we can also print, in this case, this sort of soft touch coating. The white in the top part is a rigid plastic, but the black is a rubber-like plastic and it has this soft touch kind of scratch resistant layering so we don't damage our part during the assembly process. Inspection fixtures are another fixtures that we use day in, day out. There's a company called Rapid Fit Plus that is owned by Materialize and they specialize in the rapid creation of jigs and fixtures specifically for the automotive realm. And one of the unique things about their setup is their use of sort of modular shapes with the black 8020 that you see there and then 3D printing only the end caps, only the areas that would be most expensive to machine and are most complex in shape. That's where 3D printing today makes the most sense is if we can eliminate complex machining and that's what they've done here. With Rapid Fit Plus, they use SLS printed nylon and they can achieve uh, tolerances of plus or minus 0.05 millimeters. So these are very accurate, very precise. They can be used in an automotive environment without fear of, you know, of skewing the results. One of the nice things about having this ultimate design freedom when it comes to creating these fixtures 
is we can design around our CMM machine or how are we going to take these measurements and we can very easily design around that accessibility issue. Those jigs and fixtures, when I was working for a medical device company involved in creating assembly line stations, we used jigs and fixtures, you know, an assembly line station is really just an assortment of jigs and fixtures. You can think about it that way. And I used 3D printing extensively for the creation of those geometries. It made my job infinitely easier to where I could come in in the morning with an idea. I could design it, print it, and have it at my desk that afternoon or the next day and I can continue on with my idea. I could try several iterations of an idea and choose the best one, whereas without the 3D printer, I would be sort of hedging my bets on an idea that I thought would work and I would have to commit to it early on. Using 3D printed parts alongside the creation of composites, say carbon fiber or fiberglass or Kevlar fiber, is becoming very popular. This example here is from a company called True Design in partnership with the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. If you've been following 3D printing like I have over the past few years, you might have heard this story out of IMTS last year where Oak Ridge National Laboratory printed a full-size car called the Stratticar. And they did that on a big area additive manufacturing machine developed in partnership through Oak Ridge National Laboratory and Cincinnati, which is a longtime machine tool manufacturer. They created this machine that can print in an envelope that measures in meters. And so what you're looking at here is a print off that machine. It's been post-machined and hand smoothed in anticipation for doing a carbon fiber layup. This particular shape is the hood of a Shelby Cobra. Oak Ridge National Laboratory printed a second car. It was a replica of a Shelby Cobra, full-size replica, made with this ABS carbon fiber blend that they use. And it had carbon fiber body panels put onto it. So we're looking at the mold of one of the hoods. Lots of interesting images. I, I felt bad I could only provide one, but this was the best image that actually showed the carbon fiber layup tool. We can also do captured mold patterns so this is just a straight layup. We're, we're putting carbon fiber on one side. But with FDM technology and, and, and soluble materials, we can actually wrap or enclose parts, say like a bike frame in carbon fiber, dissolve that out and end up with you know, a rapid dissolvable one-time use tool for creating hollow carbon fiber parts. That's a huge application in automotive. Injection molding and using 3D printed mold inserts is a hot, hot, hot application over the past year, year and a half. These are parts that I created and used a little benchtop injection mold machine. It's from a company called LNS Technologies. It was also a Kickstarter company. And I use 3D printed molds. So these molds are printed in a Vero material off an object machine. And I created thermoplastic elastomer parts. So I cannot print in TPE. But I, can, I also can't print in things like polypropylene, polyethylene, Delrin, other semi-crystalline thermoplastics that have a lot of industrial uses to them. There's no way to directly print them in them. So we can create rapid kind of short run injection mold tools and use them on full sized 50, 80, 100 ton injection mold machines and expect to get a dozen to 100 plus parts out of them. One of the key applications for short run injection molds is the creation of medical parts in anticipation for FDA certification process. So if you're going through the certification process, you have to have the true to spec material going into your testing. And the creation of the tooling for those true materials, say it's polycarbonate, uh, is expensive. You're looking at weeks of time and approaching $10,000 or more. We can do short run injection molds to create 50 parts in two days out of polycarbonate using this technology. So lots of uses in the medical realm. The last current application that I see a lot of is marketing models. Using these scaled down or scaled up models to help display ideas to prospective customers. We have some valves here created by solid ideas that have this cutaway in them that allows you to bring these models into a trade show, let your prospects pick them up, look at them, and you can point to a specific spot and say, here's where my product is different than the others. And because a person learns best by you know, holding a part, having this tactile feedback and playing around and moving parts on their own, 
this is going to be a lot more memorable once the person leaves and they have you know dozens of cards in their pocket from their trade show they're going to remember that 3d printed part that they held in their hands so moving on into the future it's very easy to become speculative when you start talking about the future of 3d printing and I understand that. I live that every day when I spend 30 minutes in the morning just keeping up on, you know, what's the latest in 3D printing. And you see a lot of hype. You see a lot of projected numbers. And it becomes very difficult to decipher what is believable and what is exaggerated. So I try to be very grounded in what I consider the future here. So we can think of it as more of like a near-term future. Things that I've already started to see kind of fall into motion. And kind of referencing some very respected people in the industry like Terry Wohlers when I actually talk about numbers. So things that we need to see in the future are increased throughput and speed of the machines. This could come through improvements in the existing technologies like adding more print heads or higher powered lasers, but it could also come from the creation of brand new technologies like we saw with Clip from Carbon 3D this past year, which has blown everything else out of the water when it comes to throughput if it turns out to be you know, viable. Also improved materials. We need more semi-crystalline thermoplastics, things like polypropylene, polyethylene, maybe consumer grade plastics that are highly, highly needed and wanted by the industry. More composite polymers. So mixing plastics with metal powders, continuous fibers, and even research into embedded nanotubes and aligned nanotubes. I personally know a couple people involved in that arena and it could be game changing if they can do something along those lines. Conductive materials, there is a huge demand for easily printed conductive materials for say directly printing three dimensional traces. Greater variety in photopolymers. Photopolymers happen to be the most popular group of materials around and, and that is because they have so many qualitative and quantitative differences in terms of colors and strengths and flexibility and clarity, very compelling material group. Multi-material parts, we can do that on the plastic sides already. We, can, we saw an example in the jigs and fixtures earlier, but there is a demand for say metals and ceramics side by side. It's a very difficult engineering task, but there's work being done into having a metal and ceramic composite part. We use metal ceramics all day uh, without knowing them. If you are using machine tools and carbide tooling, that's a combination of metals and ceramics. And so it's a very durable material that has a lot of industrial uses. And then also improvements in metals post-processing. You know, metals is where I think a lot of the future use is going to be, especially on the production side. And we need improvements in how we post-process those metals when it comes to corrosion resistance, handling warp, anticipating warp during the process. I know Lawrence Livermore Laboratories is doing a lot of research into pre-processing the printing in metals. Heat treating and plating also. Lastly, we need improvements in the software in kind of two realms. We need greater accessibility. We need to make it so that you don't have to have an engineering degree to create 3D printed parts. But if you do have an engineering degree and you're trained in simulation, we want to be able to optimize our parts fully. So we're going to blow through these uh, this comes from Siemens. They did some research into sort of anticipated changes in the time and cost it takes to print metal over the next few years. So you can see some improvements there. Speaking to the numbers, these are numbers from the Wohler's report in 2013 and 2014. 2013 in the dark gray, it's sort of anticipated market share versus an updated forecast based on the year 2014. You can see a highly accelerated forecast that has to do with greater than anticipated adoption of 3D printing. So going into the increased throughput, I mentioned Carbon 3D. They're a company that has really taken this to heart. They're using a technology called CLIP, which is supposed to be sort of a continuous layerless photopolymer process that is sort of this balance between UV photopolymerization and the use of oxygen to actually slow down the process. So very compelling. They're getting advertised speeds of 25 to 100 times faster than what we can currently do. That is not at market, in the market yet, but it's coming. Speaking into the software capabilities, there is a huge demand for topology optimization software. So taking a shape of an existing part like you see here, this is a bracket from GE, 
and whittling it down while optimizing for strength or optimizing for stiffness given a load. So you can get a part that is equivalent in, in the job that it does, but reduce the part mass by 70% or more. This is called topology optimization. And we created this part using an add-in called Pareto Works to SolidWorks. Lots of different technologies and softwares that are becoming more popular as this becomes more of a demand. You can take topology optimization software one step further and do something called a cellular structure. So instead of whittling it down to these unit cells that are 100% dense, we can whittle it down to unit cells that are variable density. So we end up with these sort of cellular lattice structures that look a lot more organic. And we can take that optimization even farther. A lot of the softwares that do this can actually optimize for things other than strength and stiffness. Things like thermal properties, resonant frequencies, and stuff like that. This example came from Titan Industries, which is a metal additive service bureau and consulting agency out of Phoenix. Did some great work there. So we end up with parts like this. This is from Airbus, and we see the conventional bracket on the left made of aluminum, the 3D printed cargo strap on the right, which is 3D printed from titanium. We see a drastically different design. It's optimized for weight. It does the same job as the aluminum part, but it uses 90% less overall material. So Airbus and Boeing and other aerospace companies, they actually have to buy 30 to 50 pounds of material to put one pound of material up in the air. That's because you start with a, a block of, say, aluminum and whittle it down. Whereas 3D printing, that buy to fly ratio is actually closer to one to one to two to one. So there's a huge energy savings there. So with mass production, we're going to start seeing scenarios like this, where a single printer can only print so fast. So a mass production scenario is actually going to involve a whole lineup of printers like you see here at Stratus' Red Eye facility, which is a service bureau that you can just go online and order parts. Speaking of production parts, GE Aviation is producing this part. It's a fuel nozzle for the upcoming LEAP engine set to fly in 2017. Each one of these engines contains 19 fuel nozzles and they have something like 8,500 of these engines on order. So GE came out and said they're expecting to print in metals here 45,000 fuel nozzles a year. We're talking about full-fledged production parts. They're already printing tens of thousands of pounds of parts to retrofit older machines. There's a huge incentive to print these shapes because we can print one part that's very complex in shape versus machining or casting a family of parts and then having to weld them together in a post process. And then lastly here, we need some improvements in consumer accessibility. Lowe's just recently announced a project called Lowe's Innovation Labs where they're teaming up with a local company in Mountain View, California where anybody can come into the store and have somebody help them design a custom part and print it on site. They also have a website where you can do a 3D printed part and have it delivered. On site, they do printing and scanning in plastics and through their online website, you can do also metals and ceramics. This idea of an online service bureau or a print on demand is a very valid business model that we see a lot of people entering into the space, Shapeways and Sculptio and 3D Hubs, I think being the most popular, but, but Lowe's is worth mentioning because it's, it's a household name. And we have not only 3D printing services in household, you know, big box stores, but also 3D printers being sold in stores like Best Buy and Home Depot are carrying Dremel branded and 3D systems machines in, in the case of Best Buy. Or you have UPS stores where you can go in and also have a part printed on a Stratasys machine. So it's becoming less and less necessary to know CAD and have access to CAD software. And that about wraps up what we have for today. I want to thank you guys for joining. This has been a really fun topic to research and present on. I'm really looking forward to how our predictions pan out. If you're watching this live, this is the time to type in those questions into the chat box or the questions box. And if you're watching this later on YouTube, thank you. If you have questions, feel free to email me directly or respond in the YouTube comments. Appreciate you guys coming and I'll see you next time.